Hello, everybody. My name is Robert Fuentes. I'm the president and CEO of the Eno Center for Transportation, and I want to welcome you to the latest in our series of Eno Center for Transportation uh, webinars. I'm happy to note that today's webinar is co-hosted with the Association of Equipment, American Association of Equipment Manufacturers, uh, and is taking place as part of the United for Infrastructure events that are happening all week. I hope folks have been tuning into those. Um, it was a great session earlier today on on race and infrastructure, a whole, a whole series of great events all during the week. But today I am thrilled that we have four leading voices um, from around the country to talk to us about transportation planning and policy in the time of COVID. As we all know, the coronavirus pandemic has hammered state and municipal budgets um, across the United States. A recent analysis from the National League of Cities recently found that nearly two thirds of localities have either paused or halted some capital expenditures and infrastructure investments for things like roads and bridges and public transit. Uh, at the same time, infrastructure spending is also considered a key stimulus tool uh, designed to right the struggling economy through needed investments and jobs. So we're all Keynesians now, something like that. Um, but the hurdles in front of us are very real for sure. And this webinar is gonna help us understand and address the challenges that this public health crisis and economic recession have brought to transportation funding and planning. So, to help us do these issues, I am joined virtually by four excellent leaders. Uh, Rodney Slater is, of course, a partner at Squire Patton Boggs and former U.S. Uh, Secretary of Transportation and Federal Highway Administrator. Josh Shank, the director of, Los Angel of the Los Angeles Metro Office for Extraordinary Innovation. Jeffrey Reed, president and CEO of Basic Resources Incorporated and VSS International, and currently the, uh, the AEM board chair. And Alan Pozarski has been an independent consultant and prolific writer in the field of transportation for 35 years or so, give or take. Um, I'm gonna ask Alan to kick us off with some initial comments. Alan recently wrote a, a very provocative commentary for the Reason Foundation uh, that's outlining some principles to guide transportation planning and spending during this time that everything is, is clearly upside down. After Alan is finished, we are going to engage in Q&A with the panel um and some some more of a conversation so for those who are joining us live you can use the questions function on the webinar control panel at any time um, you can send in questions and comments for any of the panelists and we'll be going to those throughout the uh throughout the presentation so again thank you all for joining us thank you amm a am for co-hosting and alan i'll turn it over to you thank you very much uh <clears throat> good afternoon everyone uh we'll be moving through this rather quickly uh, the paper I prepared is called Five Steps to Guide Transportation Spending. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I, these are the five main points. I'm not going to read them off to you now because we're, we're pressed for time. So we'll go through these points individually. Next, Madeline, please. Thank you. The first point I, I, I make is a uh, call for a moratorium on all expansion-based transportation investments, fundamentally because the nature of the future and future demand is so limited. Uh, the world is now anti-density in transportation facilities, anti-density in places. Uh, we have the advent of autonomous vehicles and demographics changes, all of which made it for very difficult forecasting of demand even before COVID, uh, getting back to where we were, which was very small growth, 0.8% last year, um, it's very small. Where will offices and homes and workers be in the future? I think any proponent of major projects has an immense burden of proof on any forecasted needs in the future. Private investment ex accepted. If those people want to invest their funds, so be it. I will certainly welcome it. Uh, next, please. The main point that I'm making at this stage is what we should focus on in the absence of a clear sense of the future is improving the condition of the existing system. We have an immense backlog of needed infrastructure investments. And if we need a rapid stimulus, that's probably the best place to be working rather than things that are 20 years away. Respond to the maintenance, reconstruction, and safety needs of our system and, and prepare for some of the coming technical challenges that we're all going to be facing. Next. Uh, slide three, 
uh, says focuses on the whole work at home trend, which has really upended the solution, the situation. It's already exceeded transit share by 19 by 2017, <clears throat> and it has hit all commute modes very hard, auto and transit. Uh, <clears throat> it has modified the whole homework nexus of trips, the two anchors of much of our travel. All of those activities, if they happen at all now, <clears throat> will happen in different directions and times. Uh, I'm looking at a future more likely a two or three day per week work at home kind of a model uh, for the nation. This will generate less congestion, less fuel, uh, less pollution, less time spent, and, and less money spent in travel. This whole war concept supports further suburbanization and exurbanization. Uh, number four, please. Uh, this is a slide that I just put together quickly. It looks at the extent growth trends and uh, declines and increases and how the working at home universe affects that. And you see that almost all of the declining trends are reinforced by the working at home context. And, and some of the changes are a little more questionable, uh, restaurant use, long distance travel, home delivery, those factors, I think, will will come into play uh, as 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 these things develop in the next couple of years. Next, please. Uh, my fourth point, I think, is 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 really a critical one. What I think we need to be doing is focusing much further on shifting transportation funding to serve the accessibility needs of the lower income populations, those most likely not to be heavily affected by working at home. Uh, lower income jobs tend to be more focused on person based activities, restaurants, hotels, more based on, on tools, on floor space, on technology, manufacturing, warehouses, offices, stores. We need an immediate response system to solve these access issues and get the services to the less skilled. We need to open service to entrepreneurship, both public and private and modify some of the public tools if we need to, TIFIA and others, in order to be more supportive of this, of this really uh, rapid onset need. Uh, five, please. Uh, I wanna emphasize a strong focus on private sector solutions to respond to some of these needs. Looking around, you see, I see a small bus-based system, van-based systems, uh, both public and private. I'm looking at, I'm seeing the car rental vans, the hotel vans, all sitting around uh, doing nothing at the moment. Microsoft is one of the, it's the third largest bus operator in Seattle. Super Shuttle has 27 airports and is branching out. Company vans like 3M companies, where they give a, a van to an employee to bring employees to Uber pool, lift line, again, broadening out into a, into a paratransit kind of world, and some mass concepts of immediate response, which is the key component, is, is really where we are. Uh, closing slide, please. Finally, the five points come down to this. There's no really convincing future demand justification that we can make at this time, particularly for 10 or 20 year out projects. We need a fast, massive backlog approach. Uh, we need to look at ways to, to address uh, the work at home world and how that will impact. It will probably surpass carpooling as number two to driving alone in commuting behavior and in all the other activities, not just commuting. Um, shifting to accessibility needs of lower income is a critical need and a very fast response. Finally, the fifth point is basically open the system up to new opportunities. Thank you all. Thanks very much, Alan. Um, sure thing. Uh, it sounds great, and um, it, thank you for, for kicking this off. Because we were looking for something that we're, we're talking about. What's different? Clearly, we know that things that things have changed. I mean, the revenue is way down. We don't know what's going to happen. The commuting patterns. I'm glad you talked about telework, especially for those people who who can um, who have the ability to do it. As 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 you pointed out, not everybody is is able to. Um, 
but um, but clearly things have changed and there's there, there's there, what it's going to look like in the future is still I think the unknown so let me let me kick it over to the panel and Secretary Slater I'd like to, to start with you uh, you have been you know a tireless advocate for uh, advanced technology and innovation when it comes to transportation especially recently um, so how do you think about all that in this in this current moment how does how does the pandemic does it impede or does it accelerate our thinking and planning when it comes to moving to the transportation system of the future that you have talked about so eloquently for, for a number of years. How does it, how does it play out now? Mm. Uh, well, thanks, uh, Rob, and thanks to the uh, Eno Center for affording us all this opportunity to, um, to come together. And also, um, uh, thank you, um, uh, Jeffrey, for your uh, leadership and, and for the um, equipment manufacturers being a partner with the Eno Center uh, for this uh, important uh, session. Uh, I look forward, by the way, not only to offering some comments, but uh, continuing to hear from the insights of people like uh, like Joshua and Alan. You did a great job in uh, painting uh, a picture as you see it um, uh, as it relates to the future. Uh, I, I would uh, think about it just a little differently, though. I think that this period is accelerating a lot of what we were toying with uh, as relates to improvements to our transportation system over uh, really the last 20 or so years. I, I can remember during uh, my tenure as a secretary where we were talking about the um, intelligent transportation system, where we were talking about intermodalism, where all the systems of transportation would work together. Uh, where we were introduced with this concept of the information superhighway and clearly broadband <laughs> uh, uh, speaks to the ability to deliver on that kind of system. And so what the pandemic has done is it, is a, it has forced us to sort of pause and to, um, and to think differently about this different experience that we are now grappling with. Um, it's interesting how we have, um, as we talk about uh, individuals living in maybe low-income communities, if you will, or uh, yeah. having challenges as it relates to transportation, those individuals in many cases have been seen as essential workers. Uh, individuals whose job responsibility very, very critical to the ongoing functioning of our society, but in years past, their work might have been taken for granted. Uh, and I'll just give you one or two examples. I mean, when we go to a store now, we know that in order for those products to be where they're supposed to be, where we expect them to be, people have had to come in and spend a lot more time in that store, uh, social distancing and, and, and dealing with all of the challenges that we are sensitive to as we prepare to make that 20 minute run, right? Where we're in and out in a few minutes, but we recognize that there have been people who could not do that work from home, but who were essential in getting to those locations and doing that work for our benefit. Uh, the people who clean up those facilities and help to sanitize them, uh, those individuals, again, a lot of time out of our uh, 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 zone of vision, we recognize now as being essential uh, to the enjoyment of opportunities that we take for granted. And so, Alan, I very much appreciated your reference to um, the need that they have for transportation opportunities to get them to the places where they need to work, where they don't have the luxury of necessarily working at home. Uh, and so I, I, I think that uh, not only are we thinking about transportation differently, but we're also thinking about those who have to be served by it differently as well. I think uh, automation is just going to speed up. And I think the only concern I have about uh, Alan just working on the basic system as it is, is that I know that even 
COVID, the basic system as it is, was not a system that could serve our needs. I mean, we've got to continue to be creative and visionary and insightful uh, in thinking of this system for the future that has to help us live in a future that will hopefully continue to give us the kind of um, economic opportunities and pursuit of life opportunities that we have enjoyed in the past. Uh, and I would just like to maybe close here and we can come back with a few questions. I'd like to just close with saying that just as infrastructure has been essential in helping to get us to where we um, are, it'll be essential in helping to get us to where we need to be. Uh, but I think that we've got to build back better. I think we've got to continue to move forward. I think that that's what the call of the future demands. And I think that there is too much benefit tied up in technology, uh, 5G technology, our movement towards this fourth industrial revolution that holds so much promise for us to just be trying to get back to where we were. We need to enhance that foundation, but build on it and move from strength to strength, as one might say. That's excellent. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. And I'm glad for your comments and your references there at the end about the other things that this, is, this has been just a conversation about transportation or health. It is a conversation about other technologies. I can see from the questions that are coming in now, a lot of questions about commercial real estate and what happens. So all these things are clearly tied together. So you're right, it's not certainly just one thing. So but we'll get to those in, in just a minute, but I wanna to go to Joshua. You, you're you living this every day, right? living this on the ground in Los Angeles, running the, the Los Angeles Office of Extraordinary Innovation. Uh, among other things, you're also chairing this recovery task force that the LA Metro has built together. So talk to us about, that, about what the task force is doing, how that's playing out and how that's connected to the stuff that we're talking about here today. Yeah, happy to. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, I think we we have a slightly different take, um, but with many of the same conclusions as Alan. Um, for I, I think the one of, there's there's some fundamental differences in how we approach this from how Alan's thinking about it. Uh, one is that we believe that density is critical to economic success and will continue to be. I think there's been a lot of evidence in the economic literature about that. Ed Glazer, among others, just you have to have people near each other. Telecommuting doesn't change that um, in order to be economically productive. Second, because of that, congestion will return. If you don't believe that, come to LA. We've already got some congestion back. We're, we're experts in that area. And we're seeing that all over the world, actually, as places emerge from the pandemic, people are buying more vehicles, people are driving uh, instead of taking transit. So we have to deal with congestion as a fundamental issue. And then the third, I think, difference is that we start with the premise, and Rodney kind of alluded to this, that the existing system was wholly inadequate as it existed prior to the pandemic, but particularly for the most vulnerable members of society, the most low income members. We had a system where uh, the folks who could not afford to purchase vehicles uh, were largely stuck in buses that were stuck in traffic that were very, very inefficient. And that's not acceptable in our minds and has to be paid. So if we start with those premises, you come up with a recovery plan that's a little bit different than I think what Alan is saying. Now, one place where I think we agree is that the emphasis on building large, new, shiny objects um, is probably not gonna be the best place to emphasize things when you have immediate critical needs that, have, that need attention. But our critical needs include the expansion of public transit. That's the distinction. Because if we don't expand public transit here, and maybe it doesn't have to be all uh, rail, but if we don't take some street space back for public transit, provide exclusive bus lanes, provide alternatives to driving alone, such as bike lanes, uh, making, it, making it possible for people to use modes besides driving alone more effectively, then the most vulnerable members of society will be left behind and everyone else will be stuck in the same congestion or worse that we had prior to the pandemic. So we have to do some infrastructure. Now, maybe it's infrastructure light, but we have to do some. We're also, as it happens, bound by the fact that we passed a ballot measure in 2016 that requires us 
to build additional infrastructure capacity, and we're not going to abandon that. Um, and it would be a shame if the federal government put a moratorium on capital investment because we have been counting on that capital investment to uh, meet the needs of LA residents who voted to tax themselves 71% in favor in 2016. And we would be certainly leaving them behind if we didn't comply with what they asked for. Another thing that we're thinking about, I think that's um, that's uh, well, very similar to what Alan is saying, is that private innovation can play a really powerful role here. Uh, but I think the, the place where we see a little bit of a difference is that I, I feel like the, Alan kind of comes at this with saying, well, we need private innovators, but we need less government regulation for them to be successful. Whereas I look at what was happening prior to the pandemic when there was a lack of regulation really on, on the TNCs in particular, who were largely regulated by the state and not locally, uh, and largely regulated for safety and not for transportation purposes, that we had a lot of negative outcomes, particularly again for the most vulnerable, because those TNCs are the ones blocking our bus lanes, congesting the roads, creating, adding more to pollution, and they're not serving low-income and vulnerable populations. They were not ADA accessible for the most part. They were not available to people without smartphones. Um, they are also challenging to use if you don't have a lot of money in the bank. So we see our job as making those private innovations accessible to everyone. And that's why we think there's a role for us to play, not just to let the market roam free, because I think we all agree that transportation is a terrible way to try to make money based on the history of transportation in this country, rather than let the private market just try to run free and make money, which they generally, generally tend to fail at doing, we need to play a role in helping them uh, work with us and work, work to serve the most vulnerable communities and to allow the innovations to thrive at the same time. And we're doing that uh, with uh, some of our recommendations in the Recovery Task Force. Uh, finally, I think the because we start with the premise that, that congestion is going to come back, um, and we start with the premise that we want to not let that happen. We want to return to mobility without congestion while contributing to an equitable economic recovery. Those are our goals for the task force. We cut, Because we start with that premise, I don't see how we get to an effective transportation system without doing something about how our roads are priced, at least in Los Angeles, um, and allowing them to just remain free for usage at any time uh, will not work. And that's why we're still working on our traffic reduction study and looking for a pilot area somewhere in Los Angeles where we can test uh, congestion pricing uh, because fundamentally that's going to be the way that we get transit moving again. We get our buses moving again and also a way we can get drivers uh, to be able to get where they need to go. And without that tool, it's going to be very difficult to accomplish the things that you've outlined as, as goals that we all agree with, right? Of helping uh, vulnerable populations, of making sure our infrastructure system continues to work effectively, and of not wasting money on things that are not going to help that goal. So that's that's where we're that's how we come at this. That's where we're how we're approaching things. And uh, but I really appreciated your piece, and I thought it was a lot to, to like in there. So thank you for for putting that out there. Thank you, Joshua. And um, I think that is the key. They're trying to figure out how do we how do we make sure that given given the financial resources are strained right now, how do we make sure that we can pivot and, and not waste money, like like you were saying. And, I think you're right. The congestion is is clearly going to come back. You can look over my shoulder and see K Street here in Washington. The you know we know that the especially during the rush hour we are um, we're pretty much back to to, to uh, where we were before. But let me go over to to, to Jeffrey. Uh, you you are also on the ground with li living and breathing this stuff every day. Your primary business is is asphalt pavement and maintenance, and clearly there's a huge demand as we've already talked about for for um, for maintenance. There's a huge backlog. Uh, and I know there was a recent survey of AEM member CEOs where they said more than half uh, of those CEOs indicated that the COVID-19 pandemic is having a pretty pretty negative impact on the on the industry. So how do you, how do we reconcile all that given the need for for maintenance that we have now? How is this all playing out from your perspective? Well, that's a lot to, to digest. We're seeing a major problem in these last few months. I think. And, uh, Machinery manufacturing and sales of machinery is, is uh, vastly decreased. Uh, 
And there are a lot of problems related to that. Uh, I think this pandemic is changing a lot of people's viewpoint of where you're going to live and what you're going to do here in the future. Uh, out here in California, we've, uh, we may be getting back to 90% of, of, uh, of traffic that we had before, but, but we've also seen a massive shift in people back into single cars, out of carpools, out of uh, uh, transit that I think is having a major uh, problem of what we face in the future. I think in some of these respects, we need to go back to being tactical on what we're working on. And with the fires we've had out here in California, there's gonna be a lot of infrastructure rebuild that has to be done. Uh, they've already started in my neighborhood. The fires are within 200 yards of our home where we live. Uh, they're already starting to resurface those roadways in order to protect them. We'll see more of that. Uh, maintenance, particularly pavement maintenance, is a key area that needs to be uh, uh, continued. Uh, the conversation here was about adding capacity to the roadways. Uh, you know, we've never really built ourselves out of the problems we have on our transportation network that we have here right now. And I don't know how you get there unless you put that investment into uh, to trying to take care of the major spots that are out there. I see some of these signature pro uh, projects out there uh, out in California. There's a lot of negative talk now about our high speed rail um, and the amount of money that's being invested there as opposed to building infrastructure for transit closer to the hubs that we have in, uh, in California. Our BART system in, in Northern California and the LA system, uh, which probably should have had a greater investment. But, uh, you know, the biggest problem I see is we do not have a kind of uh, a system in transportation where we renew these bills on a regular basis. We have a end of the month, our transportation bill is going to probably going to be renewed, but kicked down the road again. We haven't had a new bill in uh, cover transportation in uh, you know, a long, long time. And I just don't see politically where we're going to get this thing done. That creates a problem of investment for most agencies. And where are you going to put your money? How do you plan for the future when you're basically planning on an annualized basis where you're going to have money or not have money? Hmm. So along the lines, we've got to take this into a longer term aspect of uh, figuring out where our money is going to come from. Uh, Joshua, you mentioned that we have to come up with a different mode of, of how you finance. That's one of the most serious problems out here in California. We totally rely upon gas tax across this country. Uh, we know we're going to see, we're already beginning to see the change going on where we're finding less and less sales of gasoline. Uh, we've left ethanol out of the equation on that gas tax. Uh, and we now have the, the issue of, of adding more and more uh, electric cars into this mix, and we don't have a way of properly taxing that. That has to be resolved. Uh, if we're going to get through this. We are not doing away with our highways. They're going to be here and they're going to have to work and we're going to have to maintain them and see that we take care of our transportation corridors. Uh, one of the serious problems I just was reading recently is that we are highly impacted on our rail, getting rail across this country from West Coast ports. Uh, there's a backlog and many small shippers cannot get onto rail with their shipments coming in from overseas. That puts it all on trucks going across this country. And where it used to be a couple of thousand dollars to move a container from the West Coast to Chicago, we're now seeing the transportation quotes at being sized eight to ten thousand dollars for a container. And that is going to impact everything as we move forward. And that needs to be resolved. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. And, um... Let me then let me try to make this more uh, more conversational now. But I have a couple of things I want to address to to Alan, just because there's a whole bunch of questions that are coming in about your proposal specifically. And I think that the most thing the thing that people are most interested in is what do you do about projects? And what do you do about things that are that are already planned, right? Um, uh, you know, be clearly that that if things are changing now, that we may not need some investments in the future. But what do you do about the stuff that's already kind of in the works? I guess is what a dozen people here or so are asking. Yeah, that's that, that's the question I've been asked with Purple Line in Washington, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The answer is, I think, of course, especially any kind of bridge projects, any functional 
uh, construction project should certainly continue. What I was concerned about is the longer term demand argument when we just don't know what that situation is going to be like. And I think in the public sector, we have an immense responsibility to make that case of saying this is what the world we perceive is going to be like 10 years from now. Um, when will we get back to the demand levels of 2019? You can either be a snapback guy and say we'll be there next year, or you can be a airline guy who says 2025, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure that we ever get back to the same patterns. It's not a question of total demand. It's where are the people going to be going? At what time are they going to be going? What are the purposes that are going to drive that? I think the working at home thing, if we end up in a 20 to 25 percent of total commuting taken care of by people staying at home, it dramatically shifts the time and place for not just commuting, work commuting, but all the other daily activities that people perform. Uh, and I'm also very much concerned about the speed, as I think we've all said, we've got to get service to the low income populations as rapidly as possible. And that's not going to be coming from building a subway or or any freeway at any major scale. I'm not talking about a long-term forget about demand. Uh, I, I worked on the interstate uh, review that was just done by TRB and we can lay out, a, but of that demand in the interstate study, 50% of it was, was maintenance and reconstruction. 20% uh, of it was bridges. 30% of it was residual demand. And I'm not sure that, that where that residual demand is going to be or where it is now, whether it'll ever be. I, I just don't know. The, I don't think I have the answer, and I'm not sure who does. It's the, it, Before COVID, I was saying this is the most difficult period to be forecasting that I've experienced in my entire life with, with autonomous vehicles and drones and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I agree so much with what, what I've heard. I agree very much on Uber and Lyft have not been anything like a success that I consider. They're not the answers for, they're not what I was looking for in terms of better uses of small buses and vans. What we saw, I think, in the, in the COVID has been that the bus, to the extent there has been a transit so, so, a solution, it's come from buses. And I think that's been tremendously helpful. Um, I, but I still think that We've got to open that up and to entrepreneurship, people like Joshua in the public and the private sector. I wasn't simply say turn it over to the private guys. I do walk, take a walk and I walk by an old a Marriott hotel who's got 20 buses sitting out there. And you really kind of wonder whether somebody could make better use of those than, than what's happening now, waiting for a, a hotel to open up. Anyway, I'll, the only the only demur I really have. And I have to ask this question very loudly. What do we think is going to happen to density? I think anything with an elevator in it at the moment is a, is a, is a, a, pro, a very negative prospect. And I think that if I owned real estate investment trusts in downtown real estate, I'd be very nervous. Uh, firms, I think, will tend to slide to where the skilled employees are and that's going to mean more suburbanization, even exurbanization. I'm seeing firms like Google telling their people to go away and come back, if anything, September 1st, 2021. That changes the nature of the, the whole demand structure in which we function. I wish I were smarter. And that's where, and, and folks and any of the panelists, feel free to jump in. This is, I think, this seems to be really where most people are, are, are wanting wanting us to go wanting to talk about these it's less i think less interest in kind of the, the short-term things that are happening and maybe we'll tell you to do more maybe we won't but that there are maybe some structural things that are happening because of of the, the what's happening what's going on now again you said with kind of the, the spatial location of people and jobs whether that decentralizes places and whether we've seen an increase in, in car uh, purchases that are people buying more cars because this is facilitating a different kind of development pattern. So that's the kind of thing that I think we you're right. We we don't know. It's hard to measure. Um, 
and uh, it, it'd be interesting to see because I think that will certainly help play out um, what happens on the transportation space. The the one thing I'd like other folks to to weigh in on too is this issue and what folks are looking to want to know about is around the low income um, and and um, disadvantaged populations. What what then could we be doing now specifically? Because we have this moment now where this has been raised to the national consciousness. We know that there have been investments that haven't been most equitable. What what are the things that we could be doing now to actually address um, low income neighborhoods, low income households directly during this time of crisis? Is that addressed to me? Or Anybody who wants to take it up. I'll let the other gentleman speak. Well, a couple things that I would put out there, I mean, some things that we're already doing, right? So prior to the pandemic, we had created a next-gen bus plan, which was intended to reorganize our bus network to more effectively serve demand and also to move faster, right? Those are the two goals. And we've taken this uh, time during the pandemic to put in some bus lanes, a great, great time to do that before people come back and, and get annoyed. You can put them in right now. Uh, but also bike lanes, um, those are, and, and pedestrian improvements, those are all things that can help low-income populations, particularly those without vehicles, um, get around better. Another thing we're looking at is, can we provide a series of incentives to nudge people out of single occupancy vehicles? So it's kind of the reverse of congestion pricing, like paying people not to drive. Um, and you can do that if you have a an array of ways that you, they can get around without uh, driving alone. So telecommuting is a great thing to add into that array because it's become so much more popular and acceptable now. But you include telecommuting, bikes, scooters, even the TNCs and microtransit, which we're also rolling out, and our transit network. And pretty soon you have enough options that you can kind of push people away from, from driving alone. Uh, that's another way that you can help uh, low-income people. And then finally, we just announced our fareless system initiative, which is looking at whether we can get rid of transit fares altogether. And given that they account for a very small percentage of our budget and that we spend almost half as much collecting them as we get in revenue, um, it's something that's worth considering that would also be an immediate injection uh, for low-income people. And I just did wanna say one thing about the density issue, because I think you're right, Rob and Alan, that's fundamental to this question of is density coming back or not? And I guess I would, I would ask, what is it that would make density not come back because you know the, there is a, a certainly um, an immediate fear based on the virus of density but largely we're finding that that fear at least on public transit is not particularly well founded um, and that transit has not been a spreader of the virus we're finding that with mask wearing and appropriate uh, efforts you can have indoor uh, you know interactions and also there is of course the possibility of when we might actually have a vaccine for this thing, which would change all that uh, quite, quite quickly. And I, I guess I fundamentally believe that density will come back because that is human nature, that is a fundamental part of who we are, and that is how we create, and that is how we have creativity. And I think you're seeing, you know, you're for, for Google and for Facebook and many of these other firms, they're starting to be on, you know, they, they look like they were on the edge of things by saying, we're just going to 100% telecommuting. Now you're starting to see some other firms that are coming and saying, you know what, we need to be people back in the office. Netflix is one of the ones that we know about. And that's because they're a creative company and they have to have people in the office to be effective. And, and I think creativity ultimately is why the, the United States remains uh, you know, a, a thriving economy. And, and we're going to have to bring it back if we want to be successful. Yeah. Uh, Rob, just, oh, yeah, I was just going to make a quick uh, point uh, here because um, uh, I was going to come in on uh, the points that, uh, that Joshua was was making. I mean, if we get a vaccine uh, and if we become more comfortable doing the things that allow us to become closer again uh, and still maintain appropriate distancing, uh, you still have this, uh, I think, environment and opportunity for density. Now, I think the real opportunity here is thinking about how, with technology, you can reach people who are not necessarily in dense areas and make them more productive, meaning moving from the coast where you have a lot of density and a lot of economic activity 
and really using technology to bring the interior of the country on a more equal playing field when it comes to productivity. I mean, I, I think that that is as much uh, the opportunity for us as, you know, trying to imagine some wholesale new configuration that takes us totally away from um, how we are. Uh, and uh and 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 i think i think we can i think we have to start with where we are and figure out how we build better from that vantage point rather than trying to imagine ourselves in a reality that's different from where we are and trying to figure out where we go from there no you start with where you are and all of the good that exists with where you are and then you build on that you enhance that you improve that and there is a lot that we gain from density and from multi-use uh, environments that uh, transportation has played such an important role in helping to facilitate we don't want to lose that uh, in our uh, quest to build this uh, new environment that we know we have to have no, we can take what we have and we can use technology, we can use the foundation of the system we have to give us certain things that we've not had that can add to the strength of what we do have. And let me just use one just simple example here. Uh, one thing that we have learned from not being able to um, sort of enjoy the benefits of restaurants eating inside is the joy of being able to enjoy the benefits of restaurants eating outside. Uh, I remember when New York City made a decision to close off a portion of its um, area around Times Square. There was upheaval about that because they said, no, 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 we need that space to move cars, to move vehicles. We need that place for parking so that people can go into the various shops and enjoy the um, uh, consumer opportunities that exist there. But what they found out when they closed it off was that they were able to build a new kind of an economic hub uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a place for enjoyment and recreation. And I think that with this experience that we're now having, by necessity, we're discovering those same kinds of insights. So let's build on those and build on the foundation that, uh, that we have that's made us the most mobile society in the world now. I want to emphasize that. And there is a benefit of being the most mobile society in the world. That helps to give you the, an economy that is the strongest in the world, right? And with an economy that's the strongest in the world, you can generate the dollars that help you to invest in enhancing that system. Okay, so I want us to keep that in mind as well. Alan, I'll go to you for, last, for the last word, but I wanna get one more for to Jeffrey before we close here, um, because there's a bunch of comments about, about a remark you made about making sure that we're, that we're tactical about what we're doing now, which I think makes a lot of sense. And clearly yeah. it's kind of a theme of this panel. To make sure that we're that we're investing in those in making those kinds of investments that actually matter based on something. Say a little bit more about that. But how how do we move from what we're doing now to being more tactical about our investments? Well, I, I, that's, that's an area to uh, to try to cover. I mean, one of the real problems is we've not yet seen all the changes in society that this uh, this virus has caused. We are not going to go back to the way we were before and realize that we've had in the last 20 years, five or six other viruses, and most of them were papered over or nobody paid any attention. There will never be a new virus that we don't react similar to the way we're reacting now. So this is a game changer of how this future is going to be. Uh, it's amazing how many people are moving out of the Bay Area into the Central Valley, moving out of California, moving into less populated areas. It's a major shift going on, and that is going to be uh, what we're going to see into the future here. And we don't necessarily see how it's going to totally pan out as we go along. Obviously, a strong back 
Akron and, and, and uh, broadband is going to become very important as we go forward. But, uh, you know, even myself, where I was in an office five days a week, uh, you know, right now I'm back into an office a day or two a week uh, for just a few hours. I don't ever see myself going back to being five days a week in an office. I think it's going to be more like three days a week and finding other ways of dealing the rest of the time. And I think most of this population is viewing this the same way. We're finding different ways to work. And it's going to affect how this is going to be into the future. But tactical, when we get back to talking about tactical, we have infrastructure problems that need to be solved. I mean, you, you looked at what happened in Las Vegas after the uh, uh, when this pandemic started to sit in. You had massive areas depopulated in the downtown area core. That was a perfect time to have gone and resurfaced every roadway out there. Uh, it, uh, we've seen some areas we were able to accelerate some of our construction work, and we saw other areas that it got to be very difficult and what we could do. But, uh, but uh, at least uh, out here in California, Caltrans has been very innovative and in moving forward on projects during this time uh, that were available to be done. But I, I think one of the most serious problems that we have facing us is this last six months, gas tax revenue being down as much as it is, the effect of what that is going to do to infrastructure investment. It's, you know, we've gotten by maybe this season, but this next year is going to be catastrophic. And on top of that, you add up to, to states such as California, which have a $6 billion surplus as of January and now a $56 billion uh, deficit as of now. Uh, this is just not here. This is every city and county out there has got the same issue that you're going to have to go back and say, okay, I don't have the money. I've got to go tactical on what I'm going to spend it for. I've got to go fix the potholes. I've got to go fix the key things that are the problem that's falling apart. But as far as trying to envision, you know, massive changes in different other structures or going in high investment into, into public transportation, right now I, I think the funding is gone and I'm not sure we're going to find a way to have it come back for some time. And um yeah, I think your point um, about the, 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 what we don't know is, is certainly a good one, in that it does seem like a lot of things are happening at the same time. That's where we, where we start, where the secretary started. It's not just this one issue of, of transportation. It's, it's these massive things that are happening that all seem to be happening right at the same time. So uh, let me go ahead and we're, we're a little bit over time. Let me give you the last word here. Anything you want to sum up and... I know you had your hand up two, there. Two, 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 two quick thoughts. Number one, I certainly agree with with Josh uh, Joshua on on uh, bus lanes. The secretary mentioned bus lanes and and better bus planning. I'm all for that. Density, I think, is going to be a focal point for social activity rather than offices. And I think you're going to see 20 and 30 percent declines in the shares that people need in office space because of the people working at home. The key for the future, I just finished a research paper on working at home. The key to our future there will be productivity. To what extent do some people, uh, are, are they able to make something happen effectively? And in other cases where you need groups together, where you need teams working together, uh, we'll find out that it doesn't work. And I think that's a great big experiment a forced experiment on us that's going to be with us for at least the next two or three years. Thank you all for much. I, I just I very much enjoyed it. Great to see you all again and almost be with you. <laughs> Thank you and thanks for your comments, Alan. And you know, clearly we weren't going to solve all of our all of these issues today. We have to be barely just even scratched the surface. Um, even if we had two days, it would have been it would have been hard to address all this. But uh, we got a lot of great comments, a lot of great questions that came in. Um, that are kind of lumped in these a couple of different categories. I think it is clear, as Jeffrey said, we're not we're not going back um, to where we were before. And I think that has that's both good and bad, right? That we talked at the beginning, maybe the system wasn't working. So there is, I hate to say that there's an opportunity or a silver lining, but this is maybe a time where we can do something different. But clearly, as Jeffrey and Joshua have said, you know, this is also a time where we could be doing things to take advantage of the fact that there's a little there's little traffic going on and painting bus lanes and and repaving roads, things like that. But then uh, it's something I think, Joshua, I attribute this to you. I think you've said this before. We shouldn't let this shape our communities. We should figure out what we want our communities to look like and then make sure that we are doing that at this time That so we're not being shaped by the, the pandemic, 
but actually we're, we're getting the communities that we want. And these big issues um, and uh, you know other things that may not resolve are just around funding. Is we talk about governance issues and pricing and tolling, all these things I think need to be part of the of the mix. So again, we just barely scratched the surface, but I really appreciate um, the four of you walking us through this and and starting this conversation. It was it was very very good. Um, and I want to thank you all for your participation on the webinar. We've had you know great questions here. We have several more Eno webinars that are coming up this week as part of United for Infrastructure. Um, events. We also have a whole bunch of webinars on our website. I encourage you to check that out at www.enotrans.org. Uh, when you're there, you should check out and subscribe to Eno Transportation Weekly, an invaluable resource on all aspects of transportation policy curated by the inimitable Jeff Davis. Um, once again, my thanks to, to you all, to Secretary Slater, Alan, Joshua, Jeffrey, to the equipment, to the Association for Equipment Manufacturers for co-hosting this webinar with us. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today. Take care, everybody.